Okay. Yes. All right. So welcome back everybody for today's session of the Cardiff Analysis Seminar. Just uh, a reminder that ne next week is bank holiday in the UK, so we will not have a seminar. So we have a break next week and we'll be back then for two more seminars in June before uh, the summer break. So today we're de delighted to have Lionel Bolton from Harriet Watts University, uh, who will talk about uh, perturbation classes of generators of one parameter semigroups. So thank you very much for accepting the invitation and over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's a, a great honor to speak, I believe, the last seminar of the season. So thank you very much. Um, well, I, I've sent the abstract and uh, this, is, this is raw research. It's uh, in collaboration with, with one of my PhD students, uh, Spirit on the Modis. So I will say some things that are very precise and some things that are uh, not that precise, yeah? So I'm experimenting with, with this technology, so I hope you don't mind the the setting. The talk is in two parts and I apologize beforehand, I could not arrange things in any other way. So it would be abstract part one uh, and then it would be uh, uh, more specific in part two. I will discuss the models uh, after part one. And the first part, what, what I will do is uh, I will survey uh, again, it's inevitable, the classical theory. Uh, and then I will explain uh, what I want to do, which is refine the classical theory with the so-called Schatten von Neumann classes. Yeah? And then I will describe some general spectral theory consequences. So what's, what's the talk about? What, what is it that I want to tell you about is the idea of, of perturbing generators of one parameter semigroups uh, in order to preserve properties of compactness for the corresponding semigroup. And some of you in the audience would be specialists in this. Uh, this is a very well developed and mature subject. Uh, what, what we did was take the, the classical framework and, and trying to incorporate the uh, perturbation theory uh, at the level of the schatten von Neumann classes. For simplicity, I'm considering Hilbert space is only the Hilbert space setting. And I'm not considering C0 one parameter semigroups, but rather what we call immediately norm continuous semigroups. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's fairly general in character, what I'm going to say anyways, the Laplacians in, 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 in the classical settings are immediately norm continuous. Uh, 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 compact semigroups, uh, the, the finite trace semigroups, for example, are immediately normal continuous as well. So the, the, the setting is general and, and we suspect we can extend to C0 semigroups, uh, but, but I, I, we, we didn't want to get into details of how to integrate in, 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 in more general settings. I, if I remember, I'll explain why is it that we need immediately normal continuous semigroups, yeah. So, so spare with me just now. Uh, so each part is four slides, right? So let me begin with, oops, sorry. Uh, uh, the, the actual setting, the, the notation, I, I'd like to start by, by fixing the, the, the classical notation. So suppose A is the generator of uh, an immediately non-continuous semigroup. That means for any T greater than zero, T being time, the semigroup is, is operator norm continuous. I will denote the semigroup by T, T of capital T of TA. Uh, and, and my generator is really my, I, I put the minus in, in front of everything, in front of the generator, yeah? As I said, it's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just considering the Hebrew space setting. And I will perturb A, and so let me remind you of, of, of the classical uh, notation. By classical, I mean the one that you can find in the book of Hill and Phillips, 1957, the classical book on, on functional analysis and 
semi group yeah so suppose uh, uh, we have an operator from the domain of a uh, we say that it's in the j class if it is relatively bounded yeah so so b times the resolvent of a for one and every lambda in the spectrum happens to be a bounded operator yeah uh, uh, so uh, you will learn, i'll show you the notation why why is the notation in, in a bit uh, but that's that uh, so oh yeah sorry about that uh, so uh i mean we, we know this right if, if b is in this class j of a then we have an extension of b uh, characterized by the existence of, of this uh, limit b times the resolvent uh, uh, the spectral parameter r are going to minus infinity uh, well, so, so roughly speaking we are saying that whenever we uh, have x in the hilbert space such that b times resolvent it decays faster than uh, power one over r at minus infinity for for the r parameter uh, then we are in the domain of b and by by say any of the classical results determining the resolvent norm of a generator, say, say Hill Yoshida, we know that, that this is an extension of, of the, uh, of the uh, perturbation B, of the relatively bounded perturbation B. So we call this perturbation B tilde. And, and in the talk, I'm going to use this notation. Uh, uh, notice that B tilde is also relatively bounded with respect to A. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it has the same relative bounds, uh, right? Okay, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm just want to focus on this extension B tilde uh, because what I want to do is to multiply on the left by the semi-group uh, in a way that I have a bounded operator. So let me uh, show you uh, uh, some properties of, of this class J A. It's just a class of relatively bounded perturbations with the same domain of the operator A. If I multiply on the left the semigroup restricted to the domain of A, and, and I know that the semigroup is not going to, to, to it's, it's, domain is invariant on the, the semigroup, uh, then uh, I can multiply by B tilde as well. And it's a bounded operator of the Hilbert space. What I want to do is calculations with B times T. So, so this is the minimal requirement I need on the perturbation. And then I'm not saying that necessarily the extension, the, the perturbation B is closable. Uh, close. Uh, it's less than that. Yeah, but if it is closable, then this tilde, this extension leaves in between the domain of the perturbation and the closure. Yeah, it, it may not be the whole closure of the operator, of course. This is classical theory. I'm sure we, we some of us teach this stuff in functional analysis, in advanced functional analysis, right? I'm fixing the notation and I will use the notation throughout. Now, where where the, so, so okay, so now, uh, so this class, J A is denoted in the same way in the book of Hill and Phillips. So I'm, I'm, I'm mimicking the notation. And then we, we want perturbations of the, of the generator A, such that A plus B is uh, also uh, a generator. And they call the class B, capital B of A, uh, what I'm writing here. So, so a perturbation would be this class if and only if it's a relatively bounded, then I can define B times the semigroup if that is bounded for any T greater than zero. And if I can integrate near zero, the norm. If I have these three conditions, I, I can, so, so I, I have I can prove the convergence of the so-called Dyson expansion, and therefore I can define 
the, the semi-group generated by the perturbation. I'll, I'll write that later on, but so, so this is the, the, so the classical B class that you can find in chapter 13 of the book on Hill, of Hill and Phillips, yeah? And uh, so let me try to do it properly. Um, uh, well, here it is, yeah? So, so I'm, I'm just, so, so uh, I'm showing you a picture of, of where the definition of, of, of this class is just to show you that I'm using the same notation and just to show you that this is really in the book, but, but also, I mean, I wanted to put in, into context uh, the fact that everything you wanted to know about perturbations of generators is really just in this chapter 13, in this book, it's very, very difficult to extend stuff. They did everything. They spent like many, many years uh, uh, cleaning this book and it's, it's very difficult to extend stuff. Normally, people don't, don't even consider, so in, in, in later books in the literature, you will not find this class B, A uh, described at all. Or I, I know other places in which you can find uh, alternative classes. For example, in, in the book of Davis, you will find, and, and you may be more familiar, people may be more familiar with this, you will find the, the class of perturbation denoted by P, I guess by Phillips, yeah. So this, this is now a picture of, of uh, I don't remember the page number, it's, it's probably it's example three, so it's chapter three of, of the book of Davis, one parameter semigroup. And, and well, he talks about the class P. Uh, so class B is a subclass of this class B A, and 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 the difference is that you you allow the, the you require for the perturbations to be uh, closed. Yeah. So uh, uh, so uh, this is in order to avoid the uh, difficulties in in well just proving that the Dyson expansion of my perturbed semigroup is convergent. But but I wanted to also show the the example on the top. I, I hope you can see it. So, I mean, so what, if, if I think of, of more spectral theory, classical Schrodinger operators context, what am I talking about when I'm talking about these perturbations? Well, if you have the Laplace in R3, you're talking about this classical L infinity plus L2 uh, potential, yeah? Whenever that happens, then we, we can prove, I mean, if, if this example that, that Davis put in his book, we can prove that that we are uh, uh, the potential is, is a class B A whenever A is the Laplacian perturbation. Yeah. So I so I what I mean I when I was a student I read the book of Davis and then I'm I'm highlighting here what what sort of I it got disheartened because of, of the following sentence in that book. You you have this fantastic perturbation theory. But if you're studying self-adjoint operators, if you're studying, say, Schrodinger operators, uh, and you're interested in Schrodinger equations, so you're interested in a group, this class is not that interesting. The reason is that if you have a group, if A is the generator of, of a group, then you, your only class B A would be the bounded perturbations, yeah? And there are other ways of proving that. Well, okay, the, the, the classical way of proving so, so that, that the Dyson expansion is convergent. The reason, so, so, sorry, let me, let me start again. So the perturbation, it, it has to be bounded if, if you are to regard the Dyson expansion as convergent. That means that very few potentials, just the bounded potentials are the ones that will be on, of, interest, of interest if I want to create a theory of perturbation for groups for the Schrodinger's equation. So, uh, in other words, Davis says that if you want to do quantum mechanics, this is useless. Except that perhaps you want to do non self adjoint quantum mechanics or non self adjoint spectral theory. As it turns, I claim that, that this perturbation theory is interesting in that setting, and this is what I'm trying to convince you about in this talk, in the second part, right? Okay, so. Uh, so let me show you the next uh, thing that I want to tell you about. 
And I want to describe a bit more in, in detail the, the classical framework. So, so, uh, so, so the central object in this chapter 13 of, of the book of Hill and Philip is, is the Dyson expansion. You prove that if you are in BA, then uh, your Dyson expansion is convergent. Uh, so I guess, yeah, so I have it here, that's, that's great, yeah. So, so what do I mean by that? Let me be more precise with symbols. Well, if B is in this class, then A plus B is the generator of an immediately non-continuous semigroup as well. It, it has the same uh, uh, character as the original semigroup. And the perturbed semigroup is given in, in terms of uh, a, a series correction of the unperturbed one, where each one of the terms of the series, the SK that I'm writing in the slides, are iterated convolutions. So S1, for example, is convolution of T with B tilde T, T being the, the unperturbed semigroup. And then S2 is the convolution of T with B tilde S1 and so on, right? So uh, the, the, one of the main statements in, in the book of Hill and Philip is the fact that the, this tail Z, this converges absolutely and uniformly near zero. Yeah. Con converges absolutely uniformly for T in zero alpha, any alpha greater than zero, right? Convergence in the operator known for, for this class of uh, semigroups I'm talking about, yeah? So if you think of uh, uh, the, the other main result for perturbations in this framework, which is the, the Duhamel formula or the variation of parameter formula, you prove this first and then you prove Duhamel, yeah? In the book, and um, this is kind of, not, to my knowledge, and I have very limited knowledge of the, of the specialities involved in this, in this subject, uh, this is not that common. People, perhaps people haven't, they, they haven't been interested in this, but the class B forms uh, an equivalence relation in, in the family of generators. So two generators are equivalent, are said to be equivalent if and only if the difference is in this class B of one of them. Proving that the relation is symmetric is a difficult task. And it's very funny, you define, in this book they define the class B of A, they spend a lot of time with the theory in order to prove the convergence of Dyson. And then at the end of the chapter, you, you finally prove that you have an equivalent relation. It's, the, the symmetry is difficult to prove. Uh, uh, and then they, they develop the theory much further. So there are many characterizations of this class B of A. They preserve the canonical properties of the semigroup say, if, it is, if the original is C0, then your perturb is C0. If the original is immediately non-continuous, as I said, it's still immediately non-continuous, but also holomorphic. All of this class, they call it class a, a number comma A. So, so this other class of semigroups that people don't seem to study too much, they also are, they're also preserved. And this is a wonderful theorem at, at the end of this chapter, 13 in, in the book of William Phillips. But this does not preserve other characters of, of the semigroup, for example, compactness. For example, uh, if your semigroup is of finite trace and so on. So a uh, natural question is, can, can we kind of refine this definition and try and see whether we, we, we can study what sort of perturbations also uh, preserve these other more refined properties of the semigroup. And well, this is, this is the, the purpose of the talk if you want. Uh, so let me, let me see. So, so, So let me let me show you what how how to do it. Yeah. So so this is this is a specific setting. I'm fixing a parameter q greater than equal zero, and I call C Q of H the, the Schattenborn Neumann 
classes. The norm I will, I guess, denote by by a, an index Q, right? So remember, I'm, I'm talking about the the class of compact operators such that uh, the modulus of the operator has its eigenvalues p summable. Yeah. So uh, so this is this is the classical ideal operator ideal that were studied by by uh, uh, Schatten in, in the beginning of the 20th century. And, and then, the, the, so my concept, my idea is let's try and extend B of A or, or refine B of A so that I construct a, a perturbation theory at the level of CQ, okay? And uh, the, so I define a class BQ and I'll, this is the definition. So I say that, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, perturbation is in the class BQ. It's in, if it is in the class B, if uh, my extension B tilde is shut in class Q for any T greater than zero, and if I can integrate the Q norm near zero. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just taking what I need in order to prove the convergence of my uh, of a version of the Dyson expansion. Uh, I will have surprises about that in, in a second, but, but, but this is just the analog of my class B of A, yeah? And I, again, so I, I, I imagine, I, I fictionally, I say, oh, oh I dream of, of trying to mimic chapter 13 of Hill, of Hill and Phillips for these classes and say, okay. And I imagine that, that I have, and, and I define an equivalent relation modulus Q in the same way, yeah? Two generators are equivalent Q whenever the difference is in this class B Q of A. And uh, typical PhD project for, for your favorite student. Oh, let's try and prove that this is an equivalent class by reading Hill and Phillips. As it turns, it's rather more sophisticated. It was rather more sophisticated than that we anticipated. But it, this is indeed an equivalence relation on the class of generators. Yeah. So, so the the general theorem uh, uh, on on the Dyson expansions becomes the following. And this is, uh, I'd, I'd like to say it's a central theorem of, of this talk and I, I think of this theory, yeah? So what, what we end up having is a graded uh, Dyson expansion. Uh, so let me, let me tell you, tell the statement of the theorem and then I'll, I'll give you details. So suppose A is a generator and suppose B is in this class BQ uh, N in the formula that you have for for the perturbation is the integer part of Q. Yeah, I'm, I'm not talking only about Q near one, but Q can be larger. Yeah. So suppose N I call the integer, the floor function for Q. Well, then the Dyson expansion for T converges, but actually in a graded way. What do I mean by that? I mean the following. The first term correction term S, the S1 is in CQ, but the second one is in CQ half. All the way, the Ns one is in CQ over N. And then we have a tail, which is trace class in C1. And that tail happens to be norm one convergence, absolutely and uniformly for T near zero, again, okay. yeah? So I, I kind of, I, I not only have my uh, 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 expansion, but I also have, if I'm careful enough looking at the different objects of the expansion, I have a, a, a graded way. So, so remember this, the Schatten class are, are containing one another. The larger the Q, the larger the class. So uh, so this, this is the theorem that, that, one of the main theorems that we proved, uh, we believe we proved hopefully, and oops, sorry, uh, and 
so so what is what is the ingredient the classical the key ingredient to prove this theorem I'll, i'd like to mention a bit how is it that we prove the theorem uh, uh, because i it just it just tells us why is it that we have this graded uh, uh, converge so so this graded expansion and the convergence improve as we take less and less terms s s sub k the key ingredient uh, uh well we had to prove it i don't know may, maybe in books but it's essentially a, a theorem about uh, an, an interpolated convolution theorem for operators in the Schatten classes, which says that if I have uh, uh, two functions, capital F and capital G, and one is in the CQ class, the other one in the CR class, and P is related to Q and R in the standard interpolation way that you do, for example, for, for the Schatten von Neumann classes, then the convolution of f of g would be in cp and the norm would be bounded by the convolution of the norms so the p norm of the convolution is less than or equal the q norm of the f convolution the r norm of the g you prove this just using the 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 actual interpolation results for the Schatten von Neumann classes and then see, I mean, you need to trace back convergences and thing in the convolution. Uh, uh, so I don't know if this is new, but th this was the main ingredient. So why, why does it help in, in understanding the, 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 the different, the, the, the precise Schatten von Neumann class of the difference S K terms? Well, because remember, S is the convolution. So SK is the convolution of a bounded operator, the previous one. Yeah. So as I'm having more and as I have more and more terms in my expansion, then I would have a better Schatten von Neumann uh, uh, norm. Yeah. So, uh, well, Matteo said that I should do 50 minutes. Let me let me show you. I think it's useful. Let me let me show you uh, the the proof of the statement. So what I want to do is I can turn this one off and then show you this. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean uh, look the, just just the steps of the proof. I mean, how is it that we prove this this stuff or or, or as a result of this kind? Yeah. Um, well, firstly, the first step, actually a lot of pain, but with this key classical theorem, we, we just need to prove that the integrals defining the SK are convergent in the, in the corresponding norm, depending on the index. This is step number one. And then we say, ah, okay, step number two, uh, uh, let's, be, let's call phi the norm, the, the operator norm of my unperturbed semigroup. And let, let's call CK the iterated norms, yeah, the norm of B tilde times the previous S in the corresponding index. Uh, uh, and then, so, so look at what happened when, when K is larger than this threshold for which the expansion becomes straight class. If I do the summation of the trace norms, then this is less than or equal by, by this classical theorem, a phi convolution summation of the of these other norms. Yeah. Uh, so I'm reading at the center of, of the slide here. And then uh, let me call this this summation of convolutions of, of many convolutions, let me call it a theta zero. And let me focus on the step number three. We now use the definition of this BQ class, the, the actual fact that we have the integral norm Q less than infinity. And well, the wonderful property that whenever we integrate e to the minus WS, K fold convolution of any function, this is just, what, what is it, Fourier, Fourier uh, uh, transform right so it's the k power so i just take an omega 
large enough such that e to the minus omega s, the first one has an integral less than one. And then I have convergence of my, my tail of the series for, for this, this t sufficiently close, yeah? So, so uh, I mean, the details are not there, not here in the slides, they are not sketchy, but, but the idea is that what I do is I, I find a bound for the trace using the bound for the Q norm of the first component. And then I make sure that I'm integrating, I'm taking the T up to a place where my original integral defined in the class BQ is less than one. And then use the fact that the, the, the subsequent K would be just bounded by the power of this integral. I'm sorry, this, this is not precisely the proof, but it's a, a really bad sketch of what the proof of this theorem is, uh, right? Okay, so let me let me go back to uh, to to the final uh, uh, section of 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 my first part. And what I want to do now is is to well tell you about some spectral consequences of of this stuff. And I'm coming back to to my my comment that well perhaps for self-adjoint spectral theory. These results are not very exciting, but for non self adjoint spectral theory, I, I think they are. I think they are interesting, yeah? So this is one, one of the statements. And um, so what, what we call it control of the resolvent Q norm. So I'm, I'm going beyond the classical pseudo spectral theory with, with the infinite norm. I'm talking about Q norm of stuff or comparison between Q norm of different operators, yeah? So let, I'll, I'll, I'll write it like this. If two generators are related Q, that means so this class BQ, then we have two things. For some vertical axis, the vertical line, it could be very far away from zero. It could be very to the left half plane. But eventually I know that the limit on this vertical lines at position R of the difference between the Q norm of the two operators goes to zero. So if, if you're familiar with the theory, you would know that when I have an immediately norm continuous semigroup, then the, the infinite, the, the operator norm goes to zero on vertical axis. This you can prove using the inverse Laplace transform representation uh, and going to the limit. But, but this is a little bit more. I use the Dyson expansion to prove that I don't even know whether A1 alone or A2 alone will have a finite uh, uh, trace norm for, for th themselves. I mean, the resolvents are, could be far from compact, but what I'm doing is comparing them using the Dyson expansion. So, I mean, this, this has a consequence for, for a, a Q version, for a Schatten class version of what, what we call the, the now um, standard terminology pseudo spectrum of my operator, of my perturb operator in relation to a pseudo spectrum that I know, for example. Hopefully at the very end, I will show concrete instances of this. And I also know that, that far to the left half plane, my Q norms, the difference of them happens to be less than epsilon. Now, eventually, if I go to minus infinity uh, in this axis, I will get a zero difference of the Q norm for the resolvent. Yeah, and so I think it, it's in place to at least t t tell you a bit about the, the proof of this statement. And uh, so, so for example, how how is it? I mentioned it? I mentioned it just now that that well, you use Laplace transform trick in order to prove that immediately norm continuous semigroup have this property of the norm as I move on vertical axis. Yeah, so let let me tell you how it works for for this statement. Yeah, so uh, again, so so I fix an R a parameter R, and I'm thinking of a vertical line on the complex plane. And then I want to prove that the resolvent norm difference between these two operators 
goes to zero in Q norm as I go to plus minus infinity vertically. So uh, how do I prove that? So I use Laplace transform characterization of the resolvents via the semigroups. So remember, uh, say the A minus Z, I'm calling the parameter R plus I, Y, if you want. So A minus Z to the minus one is the integral from zero infinity exponential and then my, my semigroup, yeah? And then let me call this quantity here, uh, a dr of t. So dr of t is e to the rt, I take the r absorbed into the expression, but then I leave e to the i y t, yeah? So the vertical axis component. Why? Because I want to apply riemann lebesgue eventually. So, so, um, so, so this uh, expression in the integral, inside the integral is just the, the Fourier transform of, of, a, of, of this operator value function, the difference between the two semigroups, yeah? Now I use the definition of BQ, my step number two, uh, and because of that definition, I know that the Q norm of the original function dr of t is bounded near zero, yeah? So less than or equal a constant, e to the r, r is, is the position, is a position that I want to fix, times e to the r1 t, r1 being another constant. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about a generic semigroup. So the norm of the semigroup will determine the value of r1, the norm of the unperturbed t, ta. Yeah, for some constants, I'm, I'm not measuring things here. But then what do I know? And this is where I use immediate non-continuity. I, I don't want to, and I don't know too much about integration for, for uh, a more general class of semigroups. I say, well, okay, immediate non-continuity means that I can do all my integrals in the operator spaces in the Bogner sets. And because I can do that, and because my dr turns out to be in the L1 Bogner space because of this uh, estimate that I have for sufficiently small r, I can prove a version of the riemann lebesgue lemma. And because of that, I know that this Fourier transform of the dr should go to zero whenever y goes to infinity, yeah? And this is precisely the Q norm of the difference of the resolvents. Right, so the limitation here is the fact that I don't know enough measure theory on operator spaces to prove riemann lebesgue uh, 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 yes, riemann lebesgue lemma on a more general setting. Yeah, and I, I really wanted to apply things to non sempa joint spectral theory. Okay, so, uh, so uh, it's time for an intermezzo and I promised the, the second part would be about uh, 10 minutes, is it? 12 minutes? Mar Marco, do, do I have more or less that, that amount of time to finish? Um, let me check. Sorry, I can't see the time. Yes, you've got uh, you've got twelve, uh, 12 minutes. Twelve minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, okay. So uh, I'd, I'd like to discuss then model and consequences of of what I describe in very abstract setting. Yeah. And I'm going to present four examples. The first one is is what, what I call a cooked example. It's just to show you that the definitions that we've made are not void or, or maybe redundant. And then I'm, I'm going to talk about something that, that for me is more interesting. So, so I'll, I'll consider Schrodinger operators and, and on, on the infinite space and on finite volume regions. Yeah. So, uh, So the first example, and I, I hope this this helps to to fix ideas. Yeah. Uh, so these definitions are not redundant. It's not that all of the classes B, Q, A are the same. For example, that that you need to ask. 
and, and prove that they are not. So, so this is the example. Uh, uh, suppose A is uh, uh, the, the diagonal operator N on the diagonal, yeah? So I'm, I'm picking an orthonormal basis of the Hilbert space, infinite dimensional separable. Uh, and I'm, I'm forming just the diagonal operator. Sorry if you don't like this bracket notation, but I use, I'm used to it. So, so this, this bracket EN, EN stands for the rank one projections onto the corresponding direction of EN. So what's my semi-group? Is the diagonal semi-group e to the minus n t right on the diagonal? Well, this is trace class. This is what we call uh, uh, well, what what some call, for example, Sagrebnov calls it like this, uh, and he wrote popularized in a book this terminology. Uh, I'm not sure who 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 made the terminology now. Maybe he didn't popularize it. But the terminology is, is called uh, Gibbs semigroups. Yeah, so he, he uses this terminology. Uh, so why is this trace class? Well, if, if you compute the one norm, this is self-adjoint, of course, it's, it's just e to the minus t one over one minus e to the minus t. So this is fine for any t greater than zero. Of course, there is a singularity at zero and, and all of this theory would have a singularity for the semigroup at zero. The key is to control the growth of this singularity, yeah? And then I'm single-minded, so let me take an easy B as well, an easy perturbation. What about the alpha power of A? Yeah, diagonal into the alpha alpha between zero and one. And then I ask the question, well, so when is this B in the class BQ that I've been introducing that I've been discussing in the first part. Well, we do calculations, right? So the Q norm, and Q could be infinity, and I'm talking about the operator norm whenever Q is infinity. The, the Q norm of the, of the crucial term B tilde T is uh, for Q equals infinity of order T to the alpha. Uh, t to the minus alpha. And for finite Q is, well, uh, uh, this is the exact expression that what you see in, in, in the bracket on the top. And this is this polylogarithmic function, polylogarithm function. I mean, you, you find precise asymptotic, but it's actually difficult to prove that the asymptotic is is this, this what I've written in the center of the slide now, t to the minus q alpha plus one divided by q. Well, but it, it is that, yeah? And for, for us, what, is, what does it mean for us? And, and what's, what's interesting here is the fact that, uh, so for any alpha less than one, so, so multiplicative, so, sorry, powers of the A are class B perturbation all the way to power one, but not including power one. But then the classes BQ, the higher the alpha up to one, the less the Q, the larger the Q with this precise relationship, Q greater than one over one minus alpha. So roughly speaking, we are saying that the, the more I want to demand in terms of BQ for my perturbation, the lower the multiplicative perturbation of B in relation to A. Yeah, I'm, I'm not being mathematical with what I said, but, but so this shows that firstly, all the classes are different, and even for this very specific and particular example, we're talking about the, the simplest possible operators, diagonal self-adjoint, yeah? And uh, not only all of the, the they are great, they're, they're including in one another, of course. And, and not only that, but the, so the, the fact that we are, we have, a, a, so, so it would be a, a, an order of the grading, which is very precise. If we compare B with powers of my generator, 
Okay. Uh, right. So, I mean, I just wanted to show this, this preliminary example, but in practice, uh, let me show you a more interesting one. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and I would like to begin with, with a general model. Uh, right. So, so, so let me, I'm thinking about applications to Schrodinger operators. And, and this is general, as it turns, I only need to know what, what the heat kernel does. For example, suppose my operator is such that the semigroup is given by an integral kernel, which has a Gaussian bound, yeah? So the bound on the modulus of the kernel is of Gaussian type, what I've written in, in the slide here, and some multiplied by some weight. And then I tune in the weight so that I have the property in the definition of VQ. It turns out to be in this particular setting, uh, integral of the K near zero less than or equal uh, times a, a power of T depending on the dimension finite. Yeah. So so what, what kind of H zeros am I thinking about here? Laplacian or L2 of RD? for small dimensions, dimension one, two or three, and three, for example. So in that case, we, we know that we have a, 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 a factor one over T to the D divided by two in the heat kernel bound, yeah? So, so what, what do I know about these models? Uh, we know a bit more, but, but let me just show you the, the, easy, the, the easy result that we have. If the multiplicative perturb it, sorry, if the perturbation as a multiplication operator is in L2 of Rd, the corresponding symbol is in L, the potential is in L2 of Rd, then we know we have a V2 perturbation of H0. So what does it mean for Laplacian? L2 potentials would give me V2 perturbation. These are kind of Hilbert Schmidt type perturbation. And the way you prove it is you use the Gaussian bound on the heat kernel coupled with what you know about the perturbation. Mind you, these perturbations are not necessarily real value at all. I'm thinking about generic complex value potential here. They don't even need to be bounded below or anything like that. L2, they can have singularities, right? So, so these are not bounded perturbations necessarily, otherwise the, the result would be easier to prove. So compare with what I showed at the very beginning in this, this picture of the page in the book of Davis, this example. Well, if I, I had the Laplacian in R3, compare with being L2 plus L infinity in order to be in this class B of A, right? So, so we cannot have bounded, perturbation, uh, as long as I, and this is true, as long as I move the, the, the B with an L infinity, the potential with an L infinity, I destroy the property of being in this, in, in this class, in this case, B2 class. And we, we wanted to write it generic. We want to apply to magnetic Schrodinger, for example, which also satisfy this kind of Gaussian type estimates for the heat kernel. Let me be more precise now. So let me let me show you what what we know for for Schrodinger in in general R D. Yeah. So uh, so low dimension. I suppose uh, I have the Laplacian, uh, and then what what we are doing here is we we took the book. Uh, trace ideas and applications, the, the, the book of Ari Simon, the re-edition 2005. And then we discovered this, this wonderful class of potentials, which is the, the little LP of L2 class. Yeah? So I need, I need the terminology. So, so the little LP of L2 class are potentials such that when I look at the P norm of the localized potential in unit cubes, on a reticle of the corresponding plane, 
somebody's knocking at my door. Uh, uh, Raquel can answer, so, so sorry about that. Uh, so let, let, let me take what, what I was saying. So I was saying that, so suppose we have a potential such that uh, when, when we look at the potential localized at each one of the unit cubes that cover the plane, my L2 norm of that is P summable. This is this class, little L P of L2, that, that it's, it's in the book of, of, of Simon on traits, ideals, and applications. Well, uh, so, so I, if I have that terminology, I can make more precise the kind of potential satisfying which BQ perturbation. I'm interested in, 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 the, in the corresponding Q between uh, uh, two and one. I want to, to, to have as much stress class perturbations that I, as, I want, as I need. So, so and this, this is, so, so what we know is, is the following. If V is in the little LP class, for a P between one and two, when P is greater than dimension divided by two, so I include one for P equals, for the dimension one, for the one dimensional Schrodinger, but not for the two dimensional, then I'm in the class B, P of the minus Laplace. And we can characterize completely the class B2. The class B2 is exactly the class that reduces to L2 potentials. So the previous lemma is actually an if and only if, in my case, for potentials. So the class B2 perturbations of the Laplace are exactly the L2 potentials. And moreover, in, in D, in dimension one, we can also classify the class B1, the, the trace version of, the, of this perturbation class, is the little L1 of L2 potentials, yeah? So to give you an idea what, what kind of potentials we cover, uh, so they, they need to decay sufficiently fast at infinity, yeah? And, and if, if, if this uh, Japanese bracket uh, denotes one plus modulus of X square, then the, if I put that as a weight of an L2 space, well, for, for power delta of that greater than the dimension by two, I'm in the, the corresponding class L1, yeah? So, so my, my B1 perturbations need to, need to go to zero sufficiently fast, right? So, uh, uh, so final, final, uh, so I'm, I'm running over time, Marco. If, if you want me to stop, I can stop. Um, how, how much longer do you need? This is one slide. I can make it in about five minutes. Okay. One more slide then. So, uh, okay. So, so um, I mean, my final example is is Schrodinger operator, Schrodinger operators on on bounded regions of finite, but on regions of finite volume. I, I can make them unbounded. So, suppose I have the Laplacian with Dirichlet boundary condition, and uh, why do I want to apply to that? Because I have uh, a Gaussian estimate on the heat kernel, yeah? Then we know that if the potential now local to the region omega is in L2, then I am in the class B2. Uh, So I, I had the proof of that statement, but let me skip it. Uh, let, me, let me tell you what we know about this, about this class of uh, Schrodinger operators. Now we have finite ball on region, and then I know I have a finite trace semigroup. Uh, as it turns, my perturbation being in L2 allows me 
by means of this class B2 to say the following about the corresponding non self adjoint Schrodinger operator. It has a, a, a countable infinite family of eigenvalues. It has infinitely many eigenvalues and a complete set of root vectors. That's the statement that I, I've written as A. Moreover, I have a finite trace result similar to this wild asymptotics that I have for finite volume uh, Schrodinger operators. So I have that the trace of my semi-group the, the trace, sorry, I, the, 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 sum, the summation of e to the minus lambda and t. This is not exactly the trace of the semigroup. So, so I use Litsky to, to find a bound on, on the left hand side summation by the trace of the semigroup. And as it turns, the, the trace of the semigroup is less than or equal t to power minus p divided by two. So, so what I'm saying is, is essentially the real part of the eigenvalues is related that are equal constant n to the two divided by t. If, if you check the asymptotics for Laplacian in bounded regions, these are the classical. So I'm just recovering the classical asymptotics for non self adjoint perturbations of Laplacian on the region, directly boundary conditions. Yeah. And then Interesting, I have now for the resolvent of only Laplacian plus V, the same Q norm estimate that I mentioned before. As I move vertically on axis far away to the left, I have a Q, well, in this case, two norm. I have a two norm going to zero. And then if I move further, my two norm is going to go to zero. Yeah. So this is a kind of pseudo spectrum estimate in the Hilbert Schmidt norm for minus Laplacian plus B, B complex injector. Why do I not have the unperturbed? Well, because Laplacian is self adjoint and I know bounds for that. I use the bound for that and the comparison that I proved previously in order to get estimates only for the Schrodinger. Okay. Uh, I, I think I, I, I said one slide, but this is the final one. Marco, will you allow me to, to have the final one? Thank you very much. Sure, go on. Thanks. That's it. That's the final one. one. Well, actually I had this message, yeah. <laughs> we don't know for sure, but we doubt this is new. The point here is not that it's not necessarily that that this. What I mean is is the application to to non self adjoint spectral theory. But the point is that there is a new framework that that may be useful for for proving these kind of things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leno. Stop sharing. So, uh, are there any questions? Please unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. I have a question about your, your main theorem, Lionel, if you could put it back up. Mm -hmm. I should have kept sharing. Yeah. Um, maybe it was the next one actually. Sorry, it was the theorem after that. The one the theorem mm -hmm. of which you've got two operators A1 and A2, which are Q equivalents ah. to each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. The spectral theory consequence, yeah. this one. Uh, right. Yeah. So I mean I'm looking at these two statements. Uh, a and B on the left-hand side. Um, so suppose, uh, I mean, this is a kind of crazy question to expect this much, but let's suppose uh, that you, um, 
we're looking at, at a situation in which you uh, were allowing um, A2 to, to vary in some way, uh, but for each A2, uh, you always had the property that A1 was Q equivalent to A2. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that Q equivalence means that you've, you've got, in particular, um, uh, sh Schatten norm bound on uh, the, the difference of A1 minus A2 composed with the, uh, um, the, the, the evolution of uh, A2, right? The T of T and A2. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm saying is that this li these limits or these estimates that you've got here, could you somehow make them... Um, uh, explicit in A2, so so allowing you to, mm. to, to uh, you know, encompass a whole family of different A2s. Um, so at the moment, you, you just know that these, the, say, the first limit exists and it's zero, right? But if I now vary the A2 in some way, such that A1 is still Q equivalent to A2, I don't know how much it's going to change the value of that limit at any particular large mod Y. Yeah. Let me show you this side. Uh, if I understand what, what you want, which I, yeah, this, this side, I thought it, it's a good idea. If, if I wanted to do that, I need to control the difference of the T, T yeah. of A1 and T of A2, because I, I want to get access to the resolvent difference by means of the integral of, of the semigroups. Mm -hmm. Then I look at, at, at uh, Dyson's expansion, and I have a tail. N the difference of the semigroup is just S1 plus S2, etc. So in turn, I need to, to be able to control the S for A2 minus A1 in terms of A1, say. This I don't know. I don't know the uh, more precise information about the zero, the, the behavior at zero of the corresponding S, other than they are bounded. Uh, I want more if I wanted to, to perhaps do something in the direction of what you said. If, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks, thanks, it does, yeah. yeah. Thanks, but thank you for the question. <laughs> yeah. Are, are there any more questions? Looking through the audience, I don't see any more questions. Okay, no more questions. So let's uh, thank Leonel again. Thank you very much, Leonel. Thank you. Okay, so I will now.